this. All right. Let's do this. Hi. Say who you are. I'm Rob, and you're watching Behind the Brand. Something that's compelling and interesting. Okay, great. Look right into camera. Okay. All right. Let's do it once, uh, twice for safety. Yeah. I'm Rob Cordry, and you're watching Behind the Brand. Watch this one, though. This is going to be a good one. I'm Rob Cordry, and you are in front of Behind the Brand. I like you know what it. I did? I like it. <laughs> Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get the insight to grow your biz from experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with actor, entrepreneur, and talent extraordinaire Rob Cordry. Rob, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I love nothing more than talking about myself. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? Um, you're paying me for this? Uh, Sweet. I had no idea. I had no, you mean act, being an actor? Yes. Got it. Um, basically I was, uh, I was given permission, I think is the short answer. Like I was in, uh, acting school in college and I just sort of happened into it and I realized this is something I can do and, and probably would want to do, um, because I didn't care about money. <laughs> uh, that's a key at, thing. At the time. Key quality, at the time, now I love it. Yeah. I'll eat it. Um, but uh, my acting teacher, who is sort of like a guru, everybody's acting teacher is, a, is, a, is, a, is the guy, right? Sure. Nobody else can teach. And his name was Ed Golden, and he, he had a, um, uh, we had a conference, like a, I was a senior in college, we had a little conference, and he got me in his office, and he was like, and I'm, by the way, I'm doing a perfect, Ed Golden impersonation okay. right now. Gotcha. There might be one or two people out there that are going to be really excited about this. He's like, <laughs> so uh, uh, do you want to do you want to do this as a job? <laughs> and I was like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I guess so. And he's like, yeah, you can. And I was like, just that easy. Done. It's that easy. Yeah. It, it actually like it's not. It's it's kind of a cute way of of saying that like you do need you need permission to be able to call yourself something. Like it was hard to call myself a writer, which is really what I always wanted to be, until I don't know. Even when I got my uh, WGA card, I'm like, am I? Can I say I'm a writer? I'm writing. I'm getting paid for it. But uh, you know, it's a weird. You give yourself permission. Yeah. Did you get a lot of um, good feedback from your family? Like, were they very encouraging? Or were they like, get a real job, Rob? And yeah, no, you'll no. You'll never make it. No, nah, they were very encouraging. They were, they were not discouraging. Yeah. Uh, they, my dad, you know, I wanted to be an, an artist. I wanted to draw when I, was a, when I was a young kid. That was my version of a fireman. And um, my dad said, well, you know, you could be a commercial artist. Yeah. Um, you know, like when they used to draw bicycles in the circulars and newspapers. Sure. Uh, you know, so he's, he always had a practical take on it. Yeah. But with acting, he's like, there's no real practical reason to do it. There's nothing. Uh, so he was kind of flummoxed there, but like the writing was on the wall. And I think there was one time when he was like, you should get into computers. <laughs> You should get into fixing computers because that's going to be the future. Yeah. And, you know, he wasn't wrong, <laughs> but uh, now I fix his computer. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of these, there are a lot of comedians that get their start in these groups, you know, whether it's uh, Groundlings or, you know, Second City or, you know, tell us about how you got your start. Um, well, I, uh, I was in New York for a couple of years. I fancied myself a very serious uh, Shakespearean actor. Actor. Exactly. And then noticed, in retrospect noticed, I guess, that I was only really cast as the jackasses. <laughs> Twitagora, boom! You know, the guys that turn into a donkey or, uh, you know, end up uh, in jail. You're the court gesture. I was the clowns, you know, and the fools and the, basically the a-holes, which is what I do well. So where did it take you? I mean, you. You did some theater, and then uh, you got into this comedy group, and 
you found your stuff on John Stewart, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it was as easy as that. Yeah, um, bingo. Yeah, you know, basically I did like, um, I got into improv there and that was pretty much all I was doing. And then I, you know, you get, I got a commercial agent from that. It took a long time. It's a very long, pro nothing happens fast for me, which is great because yeah. there's a learning curve. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, um, the UCB, Amy Poehler and Rob Riggle were cast on SNL. Um, and up until that point for five years, I was doing, you know, a show a night or two shows a night sometimes, you know, and so, and doing sketch. I had a sketch group called Naked Babies that would perform there. And we, um, it became a play, Lorne Michaels came there, cast them, and so then everybody sure. went there, like they would the Groundlings. Um, and then it sort of snowballed, you know, a couple people got cast on Mad TV and then Ed Helms and I were cast on The Daily Show. So it became like a farm club. They started it, yeah, cherry it, picking talent. And you yeah, got, right. And you now, got... I mean, I, I don't know, people poo poo it, but it is now definitely a, a place where actors, funny actors will go because it's a ticket. Yeah. It's a launching pad. And it really is. I mean, now it's much more competitive. Sure. You know, there was 10 of us trying to get on a improv group of eight. <laughs> so it wasn't that hard. Now there's thousands. Sure. You know, and it's really competitive. I'm glad I'm not in it uh, trying to do that now. Why are you always the guy that ends up getting beat up, the short end of the stick, mm -hmm. you know? How does it happen? Well, because I think I, the one thing I don't have to try hard at, the, the thing that's seemingly innate with me, and it's not something I have a formula for, um, it's, it's that I can play creepy and I can play asshole, but I'm accessible. <laughs> That's what my manager says. You're creepy, but accessible. And it's true. Like I think Lou, my character in hot tub time machine is probably the embodiment of that because he's the worst. You would never have him as your friend. Yeah. And yet yeah. he's likable, you know, and it's not something it's luck. <laughs> That's my gift. <laughs> You know, being a jerk. <laughs> how does that translate? So, you know, we've talked to a lot of different actors on the show. How does that, how is that different than from your, like, outside of your personal life? Like, how, you know, where do you go to find, you know, that character? How do you develop these personalities? I, I don't, I, well, I mean, it depends. Uh, there, cause, because I, I you know, a lot of people um, don't like the idea of being typecast or whatever. And... Um, I'm not worried about it at all. I will play different shades of this person for as long as they cast me. I don't care. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy being the best friend, the wise ass best friend, because he only works three days a week. <laughs> uh, you know, it's great being six on the call sheet. But, um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I, but there's different, definitely like, so I will sometimes work at, different shades of, of a character and figure out maybe why this guy is this certain shade, you know? And I, I do probably useless, but pretty extensive like bios of the character. Like I have to know what their whole history is. Yeah. Um, and it's not even subtext in the movie, <laughs> but it's something that just helped. It, I, I get, it, I feel like then there's a light behind my eyes if I know what, he's doing. Yeah. So, so talk about Lou for a second. It's yeah. fun character. And you're, you're bringing him back, right? Yeah, we're bringing it back. Yeah. That was something that I got. I got Hot Tub Time Machine. Uh, I was on the set. I was working with Sam Rockwell. Very serious actor, right? Like a, he'll win an Oscar someday. And it was sort of a, like a comedy drama. And I got Hot Tub Time. I got the script. It said Hot Tub Time Machine. And I was like, oh, man. Which is what the movie going audience said for at first. It was a slow build with that one. Yeah. It's, it's a, a tough pill to swallow. But um, I was like, hey, Sam, this is what we're, uh, this is what our next project is going to be. And he laughed. And then I opened the front cover and it said, Hot Tub Time Machine based on the incredible true story. And Ooh. I was like, uh, I'll do it. Like, I, I, this is, this is, this is my, this is my greatest love. That I had no idea it was a true story. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. But that yeah. that is like that, that is a deal. that is a perfect joke. Yeah. You know, and and I was I was in. And that's one of those projects where 
I think you know collaboration and working with people you love is one of the most important things, and it's been the most valuable to me. Yeah, where I found the most success, and Hot Tub is one of those really kind of lucky, magical experiences, if I may, where you meet your fellow actors for the first time, and it's like you've been collaborating forever. So yeah, that was just a, chilled. That doesn't happen, you know what I mean? But we are, yeah. It, it, it just we would have been. We would have been at a great sketch group back in like the early 90s, uh, although Clark Duke would have been probably like 10, which is, would be our hook. Yeah, that is a good <laughs> it's a hook. It's something. Do you have a mus musical background? Because, you know, you, you play the, um, the, is it Motley Crue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, Are you a big right. Motley Crue guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a shade of Rob. Uh, in that kind of, like they want they pit that was a reshoot they pitched that Motley Crue ending to the movie and but they wanted to do David Lee Roth uh, they had a connection where they thought they could get the song or yeah. something and yeah. I was like first of all the high kicks <laughs> aren't gonna happen with these hammies uh, but if you really want this to be good I've been playing Home Sweet Home on my air piano in my bedroom throughout my entire childhood, so you might want to go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, just something you knew, know. And re we recreated the Home Sweet Home video, which was one of the most fun days I've ever had in my yeah, life. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, do you have a music background? Like, were you in a garage band, or? What else are you good at, Rob? What am I good at? Yeah. I'm good at, um, I'm good at fantasy football. Really? First place. You're kidding me. This guy. <laughs> no, I'm just obsessed with fantasy football right now. Let's go back to John Stewart for a second. So you interviewed a lot of people. Um, how did you, how did you prepare for those? I mean, those are hilarious. <sighs> um, exhaustively. Uh, was it all like pre-programmed, pre-scripted, or was it all unscripted? Um, it was unscripted, but we went in there with an idea of what we wanted to come out with. And the person you're interviewing, are they in on the joke, or no, they have no idea? Never, ever, okay. ever. Because that's um, how you shoot it, but that's yeah, not always how it is. They're never in on the joke, and they think. They know the joke. Um, and you drop in bombs and they're just drop like... Dropping bombs. <laughs> and you've got to be... You learn where and when to drop the bombs. Yeah. And, and it's easier. It was easier for me because we only had one camera on those shoots. Um, and that's why people used to ask, like, you guys edit those to make them, them answering this way, right? Which we didn't. We edited it. It seemed choppy because there was one camera. So we would have this camera right here, right, mm -hmm. on you, and I would ask you questions. Then we'd flip it over there, and, uh, and, and then I would just re-ask the questions. Gotcha. That's all. Just re-ask the questions that I had asked and improvised. But that's when they really, it starts to set in because I might change my tone or something with a few questions, and then they hear the tone and they realize, like, Oh, what uh -oh. did I do? I just, I just <laughs> stepped in my own trap. Yeah, and it's fun if, if they're um, despicable people often. Do you have any memorable uh, interviews, <laughs> someone that stood out? Yeah, there's two that were really good. One was a doctor. We just needed a, just for story's sake, we needed an expert to talk about um, children's, working with ch children's um, charities. And this was a doctor that worked with uh, children's charities. But our take on the whole story was that these people are doing it just for the, uh, the star cred, you know? Like, they just, because they're celebrity hounds. Yeah. You know? And, which is, I thought, a preposterous notion. So we get to this doctor's office, and there's pictures of him with celebrities up all over the place, and he's this slick guy. And I knew right then, as we were setting up, this isn't gonna work. Yeah. And sure enough, like three questions in, he was like, get out of my office. <laughs> Kicked you right out. Yeah. And it wouldn't have worked anyway for the joke because he was really that. We wanted him to be contrary. Um, and then there was another guy who, he just biting off a little bit more than he could chew. I was proving that voting was um, not only bad for you, it could kill you. <laughs> um, vote, vote and die, it was called. And we, we tested a voting machine in New York and had it tested, we brought it to a doctor who had written a book called Germs. And he, he was just the best interview subject because it was almost like he had prepared sound bites, but you know he didn't. I said like, how much feces 
did you find um, on the voting handle? And he would answer me and he said, he said, we are literally as a species bathing in human feces. He even rhymed it. Jeez. And we were like, oh. <laughs> like you have to pinch yourself a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then after a while, because we were just there forever, because he was gold. Yeah. And he was like, get out of my office. You guys got to leave. What have I done? So, so John would like send you out then on these little excursions. You'd come back with, with the treasure. And yeah. then how quickly does it go up on the show? It depends. I mean, we never ended up with the story we went out to get, which was part of the fun. It was yeah. all a discovery. Yeah. And, and that's, that was the most fun to me is like figuring out, oh, wait, wait, no, this is the thing. And then hammering that with questions. Yeah. Um, they were just always so good. It, it was fun. It was fun. It was exhausting. It was a lot of work, and it was really hard and intimidating. But um, and there was a lot of travel, and, and it was it was at times brutal. But then you'd come back, and and John is like he's he's who he is for a reason. Like he's very smart, and he's very um, specific mm -hmm. about tone and about even the crafting of a joke, which yeah. is what makes that show so good. Yeah, his delivery is great. His, yeah, and, th and that on top of it is, is just, he's so approachable and he's like your buddy, you know? Um, but not but, anymore after they, you're off the show, yeah. <laughs> no, after I left the show. <laughs> we, but it was, um, those were sometimes grueling. If he didn't like it for whatever reason, um, we would have to just create something completely different with these scraps that we had. And that happened a lot. Yeah, green screen or whatever. Whatever, yeah. or just going out running down the street and getting a shot that'll glue this together. It was real run and gun, um, you know, frontline type of work. It was, it was pretty intense. And you know, to, I was so scared to do those interviews because I had no idea. And watching Colbert and Carell do it, it was like, they're, they're geniuses. I can't do that. Yeah, but I mean, I'd be afraid to get punched in the face. Like you're, you're like <laughs> asking some very difficult questions, and you're just getting up in there. I know. Sometimes you, I'm just almost amazed. Like this has got to be scripted. Like there's just no way these people would set themselves up like this. It's just everybody wants to be on the TV. Yeah, basically. I guess so. And everybody thinks that John Stewart, because he's everybody's friend, is going to be on their side. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Because everybody relates to him. And then when they realize they're not, they, yeah, sometimes they panic. Um, never with, never physically, <laughs> thank God. Um, but uh, I spent the first three weeks of my time at The Daily Show, because I didn't really get any work on The Daily Show. My, I just sat there watching raw footage, you know, um, of Carell and Colbert doing it. And that's, I got comfortable with the way, like, it happens behind the scenes, before the takes, mm -hmm. how they would do it, how they would interact with the person because you got to be approachable. Yeah. So you went to school thing. on there. Yeah. 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 I can't, I wish I was smart enough to just figure something out, but I, I really like, I unfortunately have to study a lot. <laughs> so what you're saying is you, you rode the coattails of people, no. <laughs> yes. No, that, that is exactly what I'm saying. People would come to me like my brother or Jason Jones uh, uh, when they first got on the show and they'd say like, how did you choose your character? How did you settle on a character? And I was like, don't worry about character. Copy Colbert until you find your, your thing. Yeah, that's good advice. It's solid advice. Yeah. <laughs> it works. So those are the earlier years. Yeah. Now you're a more established actor and you're doing other things. I want to talk a little bit about Wedlock because I think it's a really interesting, um, not only... A, a great show and with great content and other great actors, but like where it's playing, the platform is also kind of significant. So can you talk about that a little bit? How it got started and what it's about? And Yeah, um, well, the show is about a um, couple who, well, not even a couple, they're best friends. They're very type A, um, a little OCD, maybe a little crazy. This is Fiona. This is Dave. We are not currently in a romantic relationship. We would like to fall in love. We would like to get married, mm -hmm. and we just need your help doing it. I do couples counseling. Oh yeah, we know. 
who uh, have always been told that they are perfect for each other and should get married, but they have no spark whatsoever, and they might even be gay. We can always schedule another one. You guys scheduled your first kiss? They think they can organize and reason their way into a relationship. Maybe they can. Hey, I was thinking of coming over there and engaging in some sexual activity with you, if you're cool with that. Oh, okay, let's... Are you really gonna use the voice, really? Yeah, but you don't know this couple. They're intense. We had our session. This is the end of the session. And we're not making up another one. It's too damn expensive. They make the exact same sound when they orgasm. Where is Dr. J? He's on a boat, a ship. He took it. He's on a cruise. Marriage is awesome. You gotta go into the mind of insanity, then push him to the brink of madness. <laughs> I should put a seatbelt on my office chair and that chair right there. Oh, that's fire! Here they come, collect. Bam! The checks have not been cashed! How did you get looped into this project? I mean, is it Friends Working With Friends? Was it the script? Was it the paycheck? I mean, I... It, no, it's one of those, it's the, it's the way that I, I love working. Yeah. It, it's the perfect situation, Friends, asked me to be in their little thing. Yeah. And they're friends that I trust and like and get along with. And so already, already we have, we have the floor for risk is risen so that you know we have more of a chance of it being a good product. And it's like at that point, you don't even have to read the script, really. I do, because I'm not a jerk. <laughs> but uh, uh, I... Um, you basically weigh a lot of things uh, at different levels. And, and this, things like that, though, I'm going to do because it it's, has the, mo the highest chance of being good. So it was very unofficial, and Vimeo wasn't involved at that stage. Um, it was just Mark, about the content. Yeah, Mark Duplass is... He's very good at a lot of things, directing, producing... He's very good at acting. Is this how you got your fantasy football kind of thing on with No, his but I, I won in that league. Yeah. I won in the league league. Yeah. You know, it's weird. You sh it's like you should be in that show. Uh, okay. <laughs> Where's the sign-up sheet? You know what I mean? Like, Let's why, do it. Why aren't you in that show? <laughs> why aren't I? You should be in that yeah. show. Yeah. Man, you're stirring it up today, huh? I'm getting mad. <laughs> it's what I do. That's what I'm good at. I, I see the oh, talents wow. in other people. I'm on the hot seat. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, uh, uh, Mark, Mark is also, I learned through this process, very good at selling stuff and doing something new and taking risks and something different and, and wanting to get, get in on this, um, new media model that's evolving. Yeah. Uh, and so this was the deal they came up with and it's a Vimeo's um, launching their sort of uh, version of what YouTube has done and what um, Hulu would do and Netflix, things like that. Yeah, and Netflix, yeah. everybody. Really the new studios. So Vimeo is in that realm now with this, which is exciting. And um, I also like, there's a, it's a pay model. You pay $3.99 to watch it. And I am a big fan of paying for something that is of quality. And it's also going to be the thing that makes content better. Because really, the only thing I think, I mean, you probably know more than I do, the only thing that's holding studios back from really, truly evolving into this yeah. is that they're beholden to whatever, Coca-Cola. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you, so what do you say to, you know, those Hollywood actors watching this, I'm sure, who would say, I'd never put my content next to content that also looks like this or you know if we talk about youtube you still got cats on skateboards and cats are very Which big is hilarious yeah i'm more of a dog person myself but um dogs aren't as funny on cats on, as cats on the internet it's true it's true but babies so, and cats <laughs> sorry go ahead no the model still works I mean, it's a solid model <laughs> solid model yeah don't mess with it but so what do you say to those actors who say you know my content is premium content i've never put it in a platform like that, whether it's even Netflix, right? I mean, Netflix is doing some great things and yeah. uh, 
with Kevin's project and everything that's happening with mm -hmm. House of Cards and it's exploding. Right. Orange is a new black, killing it, right? Yeah. Um, but still, there's not a ton of, you know, A-list actors there. I don't, I would, I would, well, I'd first say probably I don't get it. Do, do you get any pushback, like from your friends saying, you know, you're, yeah. you're jeopardizing your career. I mean, how could you dilute your brand, yeah. putting your stuff on Vimeo, you know? That, my, my perception of the way people uh, think of this kind of thing might be totally skewed because I'm surrounded by people who are excited by it. You know, my family of comedians, it's, it's what we do for the most part. It's, you know, it's where we create and, and everybody, even, you know, people on higher levels seem to be embracing it. I, I, I was, I just assumed that it was like the old dogs that were like, never do commercials and never do television. <laughs> Internet, that's not a thing, you know? Yeah. That's a porn machine. Uh, so I, I, if there are people out there that are like worried about diluting their brand because, because by putting themselves on the internet, I'm not sure how more eyes, the potential for more eyes um, and doing what you want to do yeah. rather than what you're told to do is diluting anything. It's, f if anything, it's making something thicker and stronger. Yeah. Gummy. We talked a little bit off camera about, you know, waiting to get picked and picking yourself. Mm. Um, what advice would you give to young people who are trying to get their start in what you're doing? You know, this is not an easy business and, you know, arguably nothing is, right? You're jumping in, you're getting started, but like, how long do you give that great idea or that passion that you've got until it's not working? Um, yeah, it's really hard. The trick is it's really hard there's so many places to do things. Yeah. Right. So, and everybody knows that. And, and I've often given this advice, like just go out and make something. Stop talking about it. Go out and do it and ship something, you know, but like, I think the trick for a lot of people is how do you know when it's not working? Yeah. How do you know when you failed, you know? Yeah. Or, or the opposite, like what are the, what's the, what are the metrics as they say? for success, like what, how can I count this as a win? It's not always money, right? Because- Oh, right. No, no, of course. No, it's never about the money as far as these things go. Uh, and, and sometimes it's not even about the applause, right? You know what? I think that it's, it's hard for me to quantify it for people that don't understand it because I would say do it and you'll get it at, when, when you're done because the, the pleasure and there's the satisfaction you get from, you know, creating your own thing, whether people see it or not, is just great. Like, it's like when you're a little kid just doodling on a table, it's, it's, it, it's, you're engaged. Yeah. You lose time. And that's what it's like when you are working so hard on something that is all yours or it's all you and, and your friends uh, because you look up at the clock and 12 hours have passed and it doesn't feel like that. Like that's happiness. That's happiness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people get stuck, you know, they get mm -hmm. stuck in mm -hmm. the fear, you know, the fear of failure or what other people might think, you yeah. know, the shame tactics. Uh, yeah. How dare you try out for that role? You've never done that role before. I mean, how yeah. and, and you know what? And that, that kind of, that defensive stance is valuable in certain ways. Like there are, you know, it would be, uh, I'm sure there's something that would be a, a bad move for me <laughs> to do. And, um, but perception, worrying about others' perception of you, I think is just a, a, a distraction that will never, never help you. Also, I say, I'd say to, and to get rid of that distraction, you might want to try and tackle the distraction that is people worrying about how people feel about the product in the end. Yeah, I talk about how you deal with that because I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of, you know, you create it and then you've got to answer to. Well, you know, as far as, um, I've, I'm, as, far as the public goes, like, or, or critics or something like that, like I have no problem reading a review.
Do you read it then? Okay. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I'm very interested to see what they think and see if see if I feel the same way and and where where it differs, you know. And I I am I guess pretty thick skinned when it comes to it because I give critics criticisms the same amount of um, value that I do compliments. You know it when somebody compliments you and it's a real compliment. Yeah. And it's a small percentage of the compliments you get. And so the rest of it is noise. Same with criticisms. Like, and if you just, if it, it's, it's so, um, it's such a relief to not have to then feed off compliments um, because then, then you're also not going to be hurt as much by criticism. Yeah, that's, a, that's very astute. That's very, I think that's very well said. You're not defined by the applause and you're not defined by the criticism either. Yeah. There's a, there's a you know, yeah. the balance. Yeah. You don't yeah. take it too seriously, the success or the failure. It's a tool. I mean, if I read a criticism that, that feels real to me, like say that, that one yeah. compliment I got, then, then I think about it. And it's always, no matter how much it stings, it's always, you always learn something valuable, really valuable yeah. from it. Uh, you're married. I sure am, yeah. Uh, how, how active is your wife in your career and does she give you kind of criticisms and, and maybe what are some of those? Um, you know what? She, <laughs> it's so funny. She, uh, she, she is definitely like, I consider her part of my team. You know, like uh, my agents and there's my manager and then my, there's my publicist and that whole, that whole bit. Um, but then there's my wife who has been there the whole time with me and understands, really truly under, understands the way I feel about life and, and work. And in a way that the agents might just be pretending to, in a way. Um, although for the most part, I think they get it. Yeah. But, uh, so she will give me the best advice in terms of business decisions. Yeah. Um, like what? Well, for instance, uh, just read the most recent one. Um, I uh, was offered a part in a, uh, a pilot, a soon to be pilot, and it was written by people that I really, really like, co-starring a dude I really, really like for a network that has a pretty good track record as far as these kind of comedy goes, and the idea was solid, but it was nothing yet. Um, and that was exciting to me. Then at the same time, I was offered um, an HBO show uh, co-starring with The Rock, Hmm. Produced by Mark Wahlberg, so it's kind of like a loosely, loosely, uh, loosely. It's like the Entourage team, so that had all the elements of a more uh, less risk, yeah. more of a short. The only thing that had going against it was that it shoots in Miami, right? It's about football. It's in the football world, and it really had everything. And and Miami was the downside because I. I like being with my family. Yeah. Um, and, but now usually I think there was a time when I would make a decision and go with the thing that's more like, this is what I love to do though with these guys, the comedy. Yeah, it's meatier. Yeah, and then, but this is just as good, really. And it's there. It's a thing. They're shooting it and they're going to pick it up. And sure enough, I, I chose it. Um, with very few reservations, but some, and um, yeah, sure enough, it's it, they, we shot it. It's great. It got picked up. I'm going to shoot the rest in November. So that was her. That was her influence then. That was almost all her influence. Yeah, she was. I might have done the other thing if it weren't for her telling me that. Well, easing me on the Miami thing. She's very, very understanding. Like almost you know, weirdly understanding about the, 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 the downsides of my job. Yeah. Um, she's the voice of reason though, it sounds like. She's the voice of reason. Oh, they, very much so. Yeah. She's the most practical person I know. 
uh, and I have, and I'm, I have to work to be practical. Um, I, uh, I'm more of a like head in the clouds kind of, uh, guy. Yeah. So it's a struggle for me to see things for what they are <laughs> sometimes. And she's, that's all she sees. Let's get a little bit personal. No. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Make um, me cry. Make me cry. You son of a bitch, you did it. Go ahead. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of bears. But I don't think that's what you mean. <laughs> I am afraid of not... I'm afraid mostly of not getting it anymore. Um, I've always been growing up watching all the movies I did, you know, talking with my buddies about how the ah, new De Niro isn't as good as old De Niro, you know? And especially in comedy, there is a curve. Shelf life. Yes. Yeah. And the shelf life thing has been sort of disproven for me because I see all these guys that I love, like that, Ed, that like Ed Bagley Jr., who's in wedlock. Like, he'll he'll do it till he dies, and he's great. Yeah. And I know that I I'll have a place, right? I know that I'll always have a place, or that I can create my own. Um, and whatever level it is doesn't matter to me. I can say I'm good at saving money. Um, <laughs> but what I'm afraid of is that. I'm more of a father and a husband than I am a producer or an actor or a writer. That's, that's my job. That's my love in life, right? Yeah. And I'm afraid that not being so, not doing improv seven nights a week sometimes, I will not understand what's funny. Talk about this, this little guy over here. This, uh... What are you talking about? I don't even know what you're... I don't even know what you're talking about right now. This is it. Is the Emmy in the way of what you're talking about? Um, this is just where we keep our china, mostly some books there. Am I still holding this? <laughs> That's uh, uh, that must seem like I'm. I just found myself holding it. There's fingerprints on this. Who's been touching the Emmy? Silence. Silence equals guilt. It wasn't us. How important, how important that is that to you? Well, it's, it's obviously important enough to uh, basically showcase in the room people enter when they walk into my house. Um, I don't really get those guys that keep them in bubble wrap in their closets because, uh, you know, it's, it's really just a, it's, it's really just a like, um, a, it was a gesture, I feel like, from the industry, yeah. from show business, yeah. and less about me than it is about blessing this new way of doing things. Doesn't it feel like some form of validation, though, for all that hard yes. work? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it feels great. I'm not going to lie and say it's like, doesn't mean anything to me personally. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, yeah, I... I it de definitely, I mean, I can't say it better than that. It, and it, it opens, opens doors too, right? I mean. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it, I don't know if it has. I, uh, I don't know if people know about it. I should probably be better at getting it, you know, out there where people can um, see it. I don't know how I would do that, though. I got two other ones in the, um, in the office. We can probably want. fix not, that in editing. Not to brag. Yeah, you, you can paint this out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah. I mean, do you ever find yourself uh, talk to, talk to me a little about uh, holding a grudge? Like, mm. do you hold grudges, and how do you feel about you know now how it is with your success, and you've got the Emmy, and you you're doing oh, these projects, oh, oh. Oh. and the way it used to be. I mean, is there anyone that you kind of feel like, man, you should have recognized my talent back then? And that's funny. Um, you know, when you're first starting out being an actor. You're like, I'm the best. I'm going to be the best. People yeah. are going to know it. And then they'll get it. 
Like, I, I don't even have a concrete idea of who they is. The guy in the high school that I got into a fight with once? Like, I don't know. But, um, but then when you actually attain some success in this business, at least my experience has been, there's no, there's no satisfaction to that. I, I can't look back and say, oh, that, that person. If anything, it's awkward. You know? It's because awkward it, going home. Because it comes back around, or why is it awkward? Oh, because my, you know, my buddies who I just like hanging out with and watching football or something, I, I, I'm afraid. I didn't necessarily feel any, anything from them, but I'm afraid, like, I don't want to be perceived as, uh, you know... Difficult. However they pref- or different, really. Yeah. Different, you know? Um, and, but they mostly, like, luckily, they, like, they just like talking about what it is. Like, what, what, do, you, what do you do? You know, what, what's the web? Um, but uh, my, there were some guys from high school. I went back to a high school reunion. These are guys I was kind of friendly with. Um, and the Daily Show, uh, I was on the Daily Show at the time. And there was actually a Daily Show little poster when you walked in. They had a little like cardboard stand up of, uh, of, of all the cast. And I was like, guys, you got to take that down. And they were like, no way, it's so great. And I was like, so they were proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. But also, not only is it embarrassing, but it's, it's on the same table with the pictures of all the kids that died from our class. Oh, jeez. <laughs> like, just, just put it away. Uh, and then there were a couple guys that I ran into, and I was like, hey, guys, what's going on? And they are sitting there with beers, and they go, uh, nothing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. And they're like, oh, what, what, are you guys, what are you guys up to? What are you doing? What's, uh, how's life? And they're like, nothing, just drinking. I was like, great talking to you guys. <laughs> Later. So not, su- not super happy for your success. It's just weird reactions to, to it. I mean, yeah. you know, most people I think are just confused and intrigued by it or curious. Like, yeah. oh, you're not, you're, you're pretty much the same dude that, you know, would light his farts on fire. All right. We've been spending a few minutes with actor Rob Corddry. Much continued success in all that you're doing. Love Wedlock. Love the upcoming movie Hot Tub Time Machine. Number two. Um, you're doing great stuff. Good work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, right back at you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Ho! Oh, do you guys feel dizzy too? Do you guys all feel dizzy? Well done. You could have done more. It's true. You had five or six more in you at least. It's true. Why would you win? I think you were throwing it. Guys, you know what's important though? Stretch out. That's no joke. Stretch out. Stretch out. Come on.